I have been very silent. I've got a lot on my mind. A lot. Yes? Yes. So I go back to my grandfather. Yeah? The person I defer to on everything. Yeah, I didn't get to meet him, but his uh, work lives on in writing. Yes, and it is very interesting work. So, uh, this is written by Philip C. Jessup, who was very influential in international law. Yeah, he was on the McCarthy list, a famous pacifist, and they were very against the industrial military complex. Yes, a group of lawyers. Okay. The passage of five years or of decades more to come cannot cushion the shock or begin to fill the gap created when Wolfgang Friedman was slain on the street near the campus of the university which he served so well. The sorrowful memorials have long since been eloquently spoken and it is not the purpose of this volume to repeat them. Nor can even the distinguished contributions to this one book compete with his voluminous writings which remain as a living monument to his memory. The contributors whose valued thoughts are to be found herein on behalf of a multitude of others bear witness to the enduring forward reach of Wolfgang Friedman's keen and sympathetic understanding of the ever-changing pattern of the problem of mankind. Wolfgang Friedman's versatility was untainted by superficiality. Perhaps the quality of his contributions to an understanding of man and the society in which man exists is best exemplified by the posthumous award of the Phillips Prize by the American Philosophical Society. It was a particularly appropriate award since the founder of the Philosophical Society, Benjamin Franklin, would have recognised Friedman in Europe or America as a worthy and worthwhile correspondent or com conversationalist, whether in philosophy, international affairs or many other topics. Let me quote from the report of the Society's committee which recommended the award of the Phillips Prize. The major works to which the Phillips Prize would accord the Society's recognition are Legal Theory, 5th edition, 1967, and Law in a Changing Society, 2nd edition, 1972. In these, as in his other writings, Professor Friedman brilliantly surmounted the walls within which legal scholars, like others, seek to confine their disciplines. He was, in Justin, Justice Frankfurter's phrase, an expert in relevance. More than most, he was able to perceive the connections between things whose relationships had not previously been clearly seen. Dubious about the utility of a theory of justice based on abstract philosophical postulates, he squarely faced the, perennial, the perennially difficult conflict of values which he deemed inherent in the solution of any legal problem, whether on a national or an international scale. Law in a Changing Society developed the theme that the legal order is both a reactor to and an initiator of social change. It re-examined in diverse contexts the relationship between the individual on the one hand and public power on the other. A man of compassion and courage, Professor Friedman in this work, as in others, showed himself able to distinguish between what the once called theoretical freedom and the social realities which too often prevented the development of moral and intellectual responsibility. Deep stuff, deep stuff. Legal theory surveys, his book Legal Theory surveys the impact of various ethical theories on the development of legal philosophy, carrying forward scholars' ceaseless consideration of law's relation or lack of relation to morality. The most recent edition considers also the impact of modern scientific thought upon legal theory. It enlighten, enlighteningly examines the judicial, judicial function in affecting change, bringing to bear on this question the author's rich learning about foreign legal systems. And boy, he was a pioneer in modern uh, modern aid financing, development financing, yeah. And it explores and it explores new conceptions of international law, a topic 
Professor Friedman develop more f more fully full in his The Changing Structure of International Law, 1964. Now let's we're going to get to some personal stuff. Wolfgang Friedman was a man of many countries. Born and educated in Germany, he was a student and teacher in England, professor in Australia, uh, Canada and the United States, lecturer in Holland, India, France, Iran and Tanzania, Tanzania, Tanzania. Disregarding the implied attribution of agency, it could be well said that if one invokes the maxim, I hate it when they put uh, Latin here, qui facit per allium facit per se. His cosmopolitanism was literally global as his research teams and students carried on work he inspired. The devotion and, and enthusiasm which he aroused in his students is witnessed by the issue of the Columbia Journal of Transnational Law dedicated to him on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the founding of the journal. He was responsible for the journal's foundation and for, for advising on its development. The issue, the first copy of which was presented to him, contains tributes from colleagues as well. So I've got to watch that. I've got to read all of those. It was on January 25th, 1907, that Wolfgang Friedman was born in Berlin, Germany, so that he was too young to have personal experience of World War I, although he grew up in the economic distress of the post-war era. His mother was French by birth, and Wolfgang was enrolled in the Franz-Soich Gymnasium, where part of the teaching was in French. He went on to the law faculty of the University of Berlin, where his teachers included Arthur Nussbaum and Ernst Rabel. Rabel, Rabel, Rabel supervised his thesis, which uh, is in German here, uh, basically on unjust enrichment which was published in 1930 under the auspices of uh, the Institut für Hollandische and Internationales Privatec, Private Institute of Something International, and which is still cited as authoritative in comparative studies of the doctrine of unjust enrichment. So he, his, uh, his thesis, how old was he? At 27 was uh, groundbreaking. 27? 23. So he was born in 1907. 23. His thesis at 23 years old. Yes. After a year in a German law firm, he went to England where he worked in a solicitor's office and taught German in an English school. But he returned to Germany in the following year and at the Labour Court in Berlin showed his characteristic courage in standing up against the mounting Nazi terror. He was summarily dismissed and escaped to England. Yes, known by the Nazis. And then I can add on to that story that he went back to Germany to get his mother and his brother and he was put in prison, but he managed to use his contacts to get out and he got out of the country, luckily. Yes? With the encouragement of a lifelong... Okay, okay, sorry, I'm jumping. So in England, Wolfgang d did not immediately return to the law, but instead anticipated some of today's students by organising a commune in Welland Garden City, a city honoured by the Quakers who provided a house for the purpose at nominal rent. Their political and racial refugees from Germany, together with a number of sympathetic Englishmen, lived in a community emphasising agriculture and manual labour, in which each contributed all his efforts to the whole. Wolfgang, who had resumed his high school teaching of German, was one of the few who was gainfully employed, and who also gave his earnings instead of only personal labour to the commune. With the encouragement of a lifelong friend and now an equally eminent jurist, Otto Kahn Freund, Friedman resumed his legal studies in evening courses at the College of Law of the University of London. He was appointed reader in law at the university in 1938 and held the post until 1947, teaching courses in public and private international law, torts, contracts and jurisprudence. 
The year before his appointment as reader, he married May Lewis. Lewis. They had four sons. In 1939, he became a naturalised British subject and in 1943 joined the British Intelligence Services. He was sent, so as soon as he could, he joined the British Intelligence Services. Yeah? Did he like fascism? He didn't like fascism. Yeah? Yeah. He was sent to Germany in 1945 and attached to SHAEF, S-H-A-E-F, the Allied High Command, where he became head of the Office for Economic Reconstruction, Reconstruction in the British sector of Germany. These experiences led to his publishing in 1947, The Allied Military Government of Germany which characteristically reflected his independent point of view, critical of several aspects of Allied policy. In the same year, he accepted the Chair of Public Law at the University of Melbourne, where he stayed for three years before going on to be Professor of Law at the University of Toronto from 1950 to 1955. Each change of scene, so to speak, involved heart-rending decisions and the breaking of fond ties, although his English, Australian and Canadian contacts were always kept fresh and vital. The last move came in 1955 when he yielded to the pressures and the challenges of Columbia University, which appointed him Professor of International Law and Director of International Legal Studies. The Dean of the, Columb of the Columbia Law School testifies to Wolfgang Friedman's accomplishments in, in this in his last academic post. The International Legal Studies Programme, of which he is both the originator and the guiding hand, has produced remarkable results on a variety of levels. First, it has produced a series of studies on legal problems in underdeveloped countries, a subject in which Wolfgang has beca had become interested as a result, as a, uh, interested as a consultant to the United Nations. So my grandmother also worked at the United Nations. She worked there until she died. Yes. The most important of these are legal aspects of foreign investment, joint international business ventures, international financial aid. Yeah, the role of, of the state and the rule of law in mixed economies and the joint international business ventures and joint international business ventures in developing countries. Second, the programme has greatly stimulated and financially facilitated Colombia's graduate programme for foreign lawyers. Indeed, lawyers all over the world are in its debt for, for its initiative and assistance. And third, the programme has supported intellectually, morally and financially the Columbia Journal of Transnational Law, which in this issue so appropriately commemorates Wolfgang's vital role. Thus, at Columbia, Wolfgang Friedman's interests were more and more concentrated on international legal problems, always with an acute awareness of their interrelationship with economics. These interests were focused in his contributions to the Hague Academy of International Law. He chaired and inspired a study group appointed by the Curatorium of the Academy in 1965. The result was an almost revolutionary improvement in the teaching procedures of the Academy and the broadening of its activities through the new external or overseas programme, which has included the sending of teams of professors to Africa Latin America and Asia to conduct courses and seminars largely for young professors and civil servants in international legal problems with special regional interest. In instant recognition of his contributions, the Curatorium invited Friedman to deliver in 1969 the prestigious general course in international law. Those lectures supplemented his 1964 volume on the changing structure of international law. Through the Hague Academy, also Wolfgang Friedman, in numerous ways, displayed his keen personal interest in individual students. And I just happened to have met one of his individual students, yes? Yes, a, a, someone very interesting in New York, yeah?
yeah, top deal maker, top deal maker. His emphasis on international economic and social problems, particularly of the developing countries, was grounded in a continuing appreciation of all, all aspects of international relations, as revealed in his Introduction to World Politics, which went into its fifth edition in 1965 and which was adopted by Commonwealth governments for distribution to their embassies throughout the world. While at Toronto, he was f a frequent commentator and debater on international politics in the programmes of the CBC. Later at Columbia, he contributed through letters to the New York Times and in various forums to vigorous discussions on the international issues of the day. One must examine the bibliography in this volume for an adequate appreciation of the breadth and depth of Wolfgang Friedman's legal writings, beyond the few already mentioned. I merely list a few additional titles. Principles of Australian Administrative Law, 1950. Law and Social Change in Contemporary Britain, 1951. The Public Corporation, 1954. Matrimonial Property, 1955. Antitrust Laws, 1956. The Future of the Oceans, 1971. I would close this modern, modest introduction by again recalling Wolfgang Friedman as a warm human being rather than as the eminent scholar that he was. That concern for his students to which reference has been made also inspired what became almost a traditional institution at Columbia. Dozens of young men and women cherished the memory of the annual springtime picnic at the Friedman's home in North Salem, New York. They were experienced, there, there they experienced the warm hospitality and delicious outdoor lunches of Mae Friedman among her skillfully cultivated flowers and shrubs. None could outdo Wolfgang in gymnastics or games on the lawn. There was a camaraderie which embraced even those European students brought up in the strict tradition of the revered hair doctor professor. But for them and their more unconventional American fellow students, admiration for physical prowess and informal friendship never diminished their respect for the scholar who was so young in spirit and so mature in wisdom. That is my granddad. I mean, you can't beat that. You can't beat that. I mean, I've got high standards for people and that's where it starts.